looked up to that kind of Hadle from he actually comes here from Denmark and he all the way across the mic on? It's on now. Cool. <laughs> you don't have to record me. Um Yeah, so he flew over one o ocean, which one is it? Atlantic? Yeah. Cool. We can duck. Yeah. Uh and he'll be talking about rocks to be on open cha open channel SSDs. So thanks. So well, my name is Javier. I'm a software engineer at Cinex Labs, and um, what I'm going to talk to you today is about uh, a new type of solid state drives that we call a we refer to open channel of solid state drives or open channel SSDs. And uh, you say, you know, why are you talking about uh, odds, you know, SSDs in a rocks to be a meetup? And the reason is that. Uh, there are some features of these SSDs that are very beneficial for uh, eye intensive applications such as Rocksity. And I'm trying to convince you that uh, you know you can go and, and use this. So um, I guess you'll know the solid state drives. Uh, they've been around for around you know 10 years. They promise high throughput, they promise low latency. And then the way to do that is you have a bunch of uh, flash chips that you put uh, in parallel. Uh, and then you put a controller in, in front of that to manage all the complexity. So Flash is kind of complex, right? So you, it's not like a rotating hard drive where you just need to move your, your head around. You need to manage, you know, write in sequential, write on a page granularity, write on a page granularity by erasing the block at a block granularity. And uh, back in the days, the decision was made that instead of going and modifying your whole IO stack, you would put all the complexity embedded in the device in something that is called the flash translation layer. And if you ask me, at that point, it was a very good decision because you could just unplug your hard drive, plug your SSD, and it would work. And yes, flash being that fast, it was just good enough to get more IAPs. But um, today, I think of FTLs as a prime example of you know what got you here won't, won't get you there. So they're they're, these, uh, they're the bottleneck. And the reason for that is that the flash translation layer, they hardwire all sorts of decisions on data placement or garbage collection, scheduling of the, of the parallelism of the device, where leveling, they also manage all this huge over-provisioning to be able to maintain throughput when the, the device is doing all this housekeeping and still trying to serve uh, user requests. And then um, the thing is that uh, you guys know better than anybody, uh, are you intensive applications uh, use very expensive data structures and consume a lot of host resources to, you know, align the auto patterns and help the flash. But in reality, it doesn't matter that you write, you know, you append and you run sequentially in the host when you reach your, your FTL or your IOs are scattered all over the flash. And that means that you need to have a garbage collector in the in the flash, selecting all the all the valid pages from one block, moving to, to another block, and that creates a huge write amplification that is just created by the device. You have no control over it in the application. And apart from giving you all these P99 percentiles that are very unpleasant, when you expect having 100 microseconds, you suddenly get a couple seconds. That's not good. It also affects the, the endurance of the device. So you, you wear out the flash, yes, by doing all this housekeeping. So uh, what we came up with is this concept of open channel SSDs. I know, I know this is a dense slide, I'll guide you through it. Um, so open channel SSDs, to give you a, a, a nice definition, is an SSD that serves responsibility with the host in such a way that we implement some of the features that are typically implemented in the firmware in the host. So you can think of it as a host-based FTL, like you know Fusion IO did back in the days, but it's, it's still a bit different. And the difference is that uh, it's not, you can have a monolithic FTL that does all the work, that goes and do all the, the flash constraint management, do all the data placement, all the garbage collection you put on the host. <laughs> but um, what we did with this framework that we call LightMBM is now being accepted on the, on the Linux kernel, is that we divide the FTL into two parts. We have a, a media manager that hides all the complexity of the flash and deals with this, you know, different types of flash, SLC or MLC, which can be difficult to deal with. And it allows to implement this thing we call targets, that is the FTL that you're interested in, you know, managing the data placement, the garbage collection, and eventually the word leveling. 
Another thing that we support is, you know, this is the, the, the kernel boundary, and this is, this is specifically for the Linux kernel. But uh, what you also can do is you can export it all the way up to the application and let the application implement the FDL. And that's what we did with RocksDB. So you'll see later, RocksDB is in itself an FDL. And we exploit that, and we are able to use direct raw flash to get advantage of, you know, take advantage of your, uh, of your flash memory. So, you know, I need to go ra rapidly through this, but uh, you're welcome, you know, I can go in more details offline. So the question is, you know, why you want to do this? You know, you talk about percentages, well, what does it mean? So, you know, this red line is a real NVMe uh, enterprise SSD. And it's very nice in the beginning, you get like two, you know, 250,000 IOPS per second, but then suddenly your garbage collection gets in, and this particular SSD is actually pretty good because it maintains a very nice steady state, and probably most of you have experienced this. The problem is, as I mentioned, you have no, you, you don't have this predictable latency, you don't know when the garbage collection is gonna kick in, and then you affect the, the endurance of the device. So, and apart from that, you're paying the cost of over-provisioning, so the, you know, the manufacturer is taking a 10 to 30%, some say that uh, some very expensive drives get almost a 50% of over-provisioning to actually be able to maintain these 50,000 uh, IEPs in this steady state. So what we did for for um, for RoxyB is uh, we take this uh, this architecture where we implement a user space library that we call libLightNVM, and what we do with this is we get blocks, we get physical blocks from the from the device. We pass some metadata that tells you what is the physical address for the start of the block, how many blocks do you have, and then we pass it to the application, and the application is actually writing to physical addresses. You're not writing to logical addresses and then letting the FTL do the, the translation. So that means to you that when you're writing sequential and you're spending the resources on your, uh, you know, on your RockCB and on your LSM3, you're actually writing sequential to the device. You're guaranteed to do that. And how is that, you know, what's that interesting for RockCB? So, you know this probably better than me. Uh, so if you have a DS table, so it's a, when you proceed a, a mem table, one of the characteristics is that uh, they're imm immutable. Once they reach the device, they don't change. <laughs> So if you happen to match the size of your SS table to the size of a physical flash block or several physical flash blocks, then you would be sure that all the pages in that block are either valid or invalid at a point in time. Now, if you think about that, what that means is that there's no need for garbage collection because when you're doing all the merging and compaction in your LSM, you actually have um, pretty much optimal garbage collector where all the pages, you know, are valid or invalid, valid or invalid. Um, then, you know, you can do the same for the wall and the write ahead log or the manifest. They're not immutable, but they're still a pain only. So, you know, when you uh, switch uh, uh, your log, then you just, you know, all the pages in that log become invalid and then you start a new one. So it's the same logic. One of the counterparts of this approach is that, well, you actually do not have a file system so underneath. So you, you need to save all this metadata, you know, from saving your super block to saving, you know, how do you match a, so RoxyB works at a file abstraction. How do you match your files to actual flash blocks? Uh, so that's one of the things that we need to solve and I'll show you how we do that. And then we put this con kind of requirement for ourselves that, you know, it's nice to have an of three implementation, go and download that, but uh, you know we're willing to take the hit and put it upstream so that it's easy for people to use. So you know, as mentioned, LightNVM is already in the Linux kernel, so in 4.4 it uh, will be available. We at Cinex we make a, an, an open channel SSD, but other people will come and do open channel SSDs, and then you will just go to your RocksDB instance and be able to run it. So everything is open source. So how we solve the data placement problem? So Again, you probably know more about me than me about this, but when you have a, a mem table, at some point you decide if you want to flash it or not. And the way you do that, you have these uh, arena block sites, which I, I think about it as your allocation, uh, is your, your, your allocator. So when you try, you write to your mem table and say, should I flash or not? 
then you you know you have a heuristic that tells you should I get a new a new block or not. So what we do, we match the size of the arena block size to the flat to the flash block size. So we work at a flat uh, a block chunks, and we actually modified a bit the heuristic because we want to be a bit more conservative. So we would rather waste a few pages in a block than actually trying to allocate a new block and wasting a whole block to write a few bytes. And you know you say, but it's only me some few megabytes. Probably some of you are dealing with mem tables that are few uh, gigabytes. So that means that your block size is going to be in the size of hundreds of megabytes or probably one gigabyte. So you, you don't want to introduce that at huge space amplification. So And that's you know one of the use cases that we're targeting. And we do the same for the while on the, on the, on the manifest. So uh, in terms of recovery, again, you don't have a file system, so you need to save all this metadata. What we do mainly is we use the first uh, page, <coughs> sorry, of each block, and we are we store all the necessary. You know, we we store to which uh, file that a block is associated, and we store links to past blocks. That way, you kind of think of it as a linked list between all the blocks. And we store also, so in, in flash memories, you have something we call the out of pan area, which means that if your page is 4 ki uh, kilobyte or 16 kilobyte, you actually have some spare area in the flash that allows you to save metadata. And that is typically used by the controller to store some error correction or some CRC checks. We take advantage of that to, to write the valid bytes in each specific uh, page. And it is beneficial because you know a, a page can become invalid or you might force to up the to flash to, to sync to your device. So a page could be half written and you still need to, to, to respect these barriers that are that are implemented in Ruxby. And you know, the result of all this is that if your host crashes, which is the, the worst thing that can happen to you, you can go to Light NPM. You can say, hey, can you give me all the blocks that I own? And it would give you the blocks that you, that, that you own because you, you save that metadata. And then you would scan the first page of each block and you will be able to reconstruct the state. Meaning that you can reconstruct all the metadata and that metadata is persisted on the, on the, on the device in itself. Yeah, and then, well, the, the last thing, you know, we want to work upstream, but uh, in the beginning it was a challenge, but the Rocks of you guys are being very nice to me. So it's, uh, it's, it's good working with them. And the architecture, again, going fast through it, is, is, it looks like this. So I'm, again, going to guide you through that. What we did is we implemented a new environment that uh, we're, you know, probably push up streams in, in some months. You still want to make it uh, stable and robust. And what we do is that we tag the files, you know, the type of file, say if you're the current or the manifest or the SS table. <laughs> and when you reach the environment, we divide the actual, you know, write into a slow path for your metadata or for your uh, log and the log, the, you know, the debug log so that you can have it in your file system. That's very convenient. You also want to have a, to, to be able to mount a, a, you know, a partition and have the actual uh, RocksDB code there. But if you have an SS table or you have your manifest or, or the right ahead log, you go through the fast IO path and you go through the, our user space library, LatinVM, lib LatinVM, and you go through LatinVM and then you work directly with flash blocks and you ensure that you, you know, you're right and sequential. You can manage uh, all the garbage collection in your compaction algorithm in the LSIM, et cetera. So the point I guess I want to make here is that uh, the LSM in itself is your FTL. And you know, you're in full RoxyB is in full control of the data placement and the garbage collection. So there's no extra logic on the on the controller side. And at the same time, Lightning VM, you know, in the Linux kernel, is managing the flash for you. So you don't need to worry about, you know, am I using MLC memory? Am I using SLC memory? You know, uh, do I need to, to worry about bad blocks? You know, you don't need to do that. You were do, handling that in the kernel. And we, you know, it's upstream, so you can, you know, it's open source. You don't need to worry about that. <coughs> so, and you know, once you have this architecture, where you can get blocks, and then you can use them in the in the in your environment, what you can end up having is a pretty much heavily optimized uh, way of using your storage. In this case, in RocksDB. So you can, you know, this is a collection of all the abstractions I can think of. You have your active main table, the read-only main tables, all the SS tables in the different levels, the wall, the manifest, and the and the uh, all the uh, you know the SS tables that are ready for merging and compaction. And you can match each of them to a different parallel unit on the device. 
Now, these, you know, and the, the, the point here is that each of these parallel units, you, you know, it's not hints to the device. It's not a, it, it, we're not defining these kind of stream hints where you go to the device and can you please put this data together? It belongs together. No, it's actually you're in control. So when you're issuing a write in the in your SS table and you're trying to read from another SS table, the read are, is not going to be waiting for your write to complete. So we're not dealing with these huge erase blocks to give you throughput. The point is to give you predictable latency. So again, the writes don't mix. You can get a, a each independent IA path can match a different loon, and that's, you know, RocksDB, it's, it's RocksDB responsibility is the one in charge. We're not making any decision for you. Uh, and then, you know, you can have all these scheduling, so RocksDB guys made a great job doing the merchant and compaction, multi-threaded, so all that multi-threading is matched directly to the device. So you don't have this narrow interface, one, you know, bottleneck down there. So I'm gonna show you some data. This is our SDK. Uh, it's based for now on an FPGA. Uh, and uh, what you can see here is that uh, <laughs> we can get around uh, 1.3 uh, uh, gigabyte per, uh, per second in, uh, in reads and a bit of uh, one gigabyte per second uh, uh, writes. Uh, for the ASIC, we're talking about uh, like three, four times faster, so we can match a five gigabyte per second. Uh, but you know, I show you this data because it's the one that I use for for using, you know, for prototyping. And what you can see, well, you, what you can see here is that we you actually scale pretty good. For each loon, you get around 31 megabyte per second. So you start when you use two loons, you start scaling, and it's good. And it scales pretty good. And the reason when you know we are getting channel bound by the FPGA, that's why you, you're dying there. But in, you, when you have an ASIC, that doesn't happen. And what you can see here is a very simple prototype. We did not went and implement all the different loons on the on the compaction because that's you know I think that people actually using Ruxby would do a better job than, than I would be able to do. But what you can see is that when we have when we're using one loon, we are you know this is the raw performance around 31, 32 megabyte per second. We are paying a small price, and this is due to the all the LSM logic. But this price is consistent in every single IA. You don't get the heat of the garbage collector afterwards. So you, you can divide this, and this is the cost of your garbage collection already in the house and data structure. When you start using two loons, you already see an improvement. You see that the, the, the writes and the reads do not collide to each other. And this is not even optimized. This is just using two loons to, for two different tasks. And you can envision that if you start scaling for different, this is a specific test was done with 64 loons. If you have four terabyte uh, drive, you can scale up to 128 loons. So you know that scales up. So what's the status? So where we are at? I mean, I'm uh, just telling you what we plan to do. We actually did something. Uh, Latin VM, as I mentioned, is uh, accepted for 4.4 in the Linux kernel. Uh, we have uh, the user space library, the Latin VM, that uh, allows you to get directly the, the flash blocks, but we went also and implement some nice logic for doing append-only storage. So meaning that uh, you, in RocksDB, you don't need to, to deal with all this metadata. You just say, okay, I want to append to this to this drive in this specific uh, loon, and you append to it, and we have then all the logic of handling all the, the, the blocks. Um, and then we did a prototype for RocksDB uh, where we got that data, but we still need a, you know, a bit more work to, to actually make a kind of a robust uh, prototype. Uh, ongoing work is uh, you know, moving all the, the logic and putting it into the library. Uh, and you know, trying to exploit all this parallelism. So probably you know, talk to the to all of you guys to see what you want to do and how we can support you achieving that. So everything is open source, apart from the you know, you we have the everything's in GitHub on the Open Channel CC project. We have uh, the code that is in the actual kernel and what is coming in the next merging windows of the kernel is all there. All the tools for managing and doing sanity checks are there. Lib Latin VM for the user space support is also there. And you know, if you're not sure, you know, should I go and get an open channel SSD or not? You should. But uh, we have support for Quemu. So you can just download Quemu. We implemented all the logic. You can just put it up, you simulate an open channel SSD, and you can see if it fits your needs. And then, you know, all the logic is exactly as is in a, in a real hard, but you just switch your application and it just works. So yeah, all the links are there. Um, happy to take any questions, uh, and I'm happy to talk to you offline if, if you wish. Thanks.
please. Uh, well, the question is, since we use an FPGA, do we have a commercial open channel SSD? Uh, well, we build an ASIC, and we have the ASIC. So we are, you know, having some customers and some partners, and we're building the SSD, so they will come soon. But uh, yeah, we we have the actual uh, ASIC. But if you're if you're a commercial ASIC, yeah, it's an enterprise ASIC uh, uh, SSD controller. And if you're interested, on you know, you can get some development boards uh, for both. So yes, talk to me. Please. Sorry. Yeah. So the question is, how do we deal with level word leveling issues? So that's a good question. I mean, at the moment, uh, word leveling we're dealing with that in the kernel. We have uh, in the media manager, <coughs> you have a get block put block interface. So we maintain a list of free blocks, bad blocks, and used blocks, and then you just give them to the application. That's where the word leveling ta takes place. And I guess that your question goes in the line, okay, how you guarantee the endurance of the device, right? So, you know, um, the answer to that is, you know, typically SSD uh, manufacturers, they go until you, you know, we give you five years for your SSD. What you might not know is that uh, you have the, all these algorithms, these smart data that actually limit your throughput as time goes by to guarantee that, uh, that uh, you know, the aging of the device. Uh, what we can guarantee you is the P cycles of the flash. So we tell you, you know, this flash is gonna, you know, the Toshiba comes or whoever Micron gives you a flash chip, it guarantees you 10,000 10, P cycles. Uh, we put our uh, ECC, which is pretty awesome, and say we can double that up. We give you 20,000 P cycles, or depending on the memory, and it's your decision whether you want to to go down in throughput. Uh, to guarantee that your device is going to last five years, or if you want to burn it out, and you know, our point of view is that it is the application that should be in charge, not us. Yeah. <coughs> so, uh, what was that? Yeah, so the, the question is in commercial NVMe devices, what level of parallelism? So, you know, in a in a commercial uh, SSD, you, you you still have uh, uh, several loons. So you can have the you can have the same parallelism as we have here. The problem is that the interface does not allow you to take to take advantage of that parallelism from the applica application perspective. So typically, what you do or what uh, you know enterprise SSD da do is they make huge erase blocks, and that allows you to get a lot of throughput. The problem is that if you have an erase blocks that covers all your loon space, your you know when you're trying if if you write in parallel you have different threads writing your reads are going to be stuck behind your writes, so you have no control whatsoever about you. That's why you have these latency peaks. Whereas in our approach, you expose each independent loon, and if you want to, you can have a we call it a write block. You can have everything you write parallel directly to all the loons, and then you get a lot of throughput. But you can get independent blocks from different loons, and then you guarantee the latency. So again, it's giving the flexibility to application to do whatever you want to do, not us as an SSD controller vendor making decisions about how your data placement should be or your parallelism should be handled. Please. Yeah, so the question is, can you share a Latin VM with multiple applications or with only one application? So the answer is, you can share it with as many applications as, as you want to. So in the, you know, I show you the, in the architecture da -da 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 of Latin VM, so we have um, <coughs> the, the traditional FTL, you know, the monolithic STL, or the traditional target would expose a blocked I/O device, and that you would use as any other block I/O device. You mount your favorite file system, and then you run it. If you go all the way, as we did with RoxDB, and you want to use the uh, LibLatMVM, different applications would come and would get blocks. And you know, if you have three instances of RoxDB and two in instances of another application, and now LevelDB, so you they each of them would own different blocks, and they would run to, to you know, they would use the, the structure that I showed you before to know the, which physical address they need to, to, to write to. And of course, everything works in, in parallel. So, and since the application is in charge of knowing to which uh, loon is uh, getting application, so, you know, then you can come with your favorite uh, policy. You know, should I carve out the device so some loons are specific for this high 
priority application. So that's something that, that can be enabled. It's not implemented yet, but it's definitely doable and not difficult to, to do. Please. Yeah, so the question is, um, uh, are we using striping uh, through different loons uh, for different uh, SSD tables? So in this specific uh, prototype, no. So we use one loon <laughs> and we write parallel into, into the block. And the, the motivation for that is to avoid the garbage collection. So if you, if you do a striping uh, through different blocks, then what you do is your SSD table is scattered around different uh, blocks. So at some point, you would need to do garbage collection. Unless you really match the size of your, you say, I, I'm going to stripe in four blocks, and I match my SS table the size of those four blocks, and I know that they all become valid or invalid at the same time. You can do that, but it's not what we did in this prototype. Yeah, so thank you very much, guys. So please come contact me yeah, if you want to hear more. <laughs>